Hi, I'm Krista. And I'm Thomas. And our presentation is on Caudillo versus the nation state. Okay. So in order to understand the Caudillo state in Latin America, the background of the condition of society at the time of the 19th century is needed. We will do this by looking at Latin America through conflict theory, and then apply this theory to the state of Latin America. So what is conflict theory? Conflict theory states that all societies have a culture for dealing with conflict. In some societies, the culture of conflict manages conflict nonviolently. In others, culture allows conflict to escalate. Okay, so in Latin America, with the collapse of colonial rule, the citizens of the new republics had few compelling reasons to maintain the types of erstwhile loyalty to central government that had informed three centuries of colonial rule. The emperor and the Catholic Church had played powerful and symbolic roles as the social glue of colonial society. With these two institutions gone or severely weakened, only the long-standing enemies of local interests were left in their place in the capital cities. The Caudillo emerged in the midst of the, this divide. Far removed from mechanisms of law and order, people gave in to vendettas and feuds, which resulted in relatively violent societies and limits upon any ability to control conflict in those societies. Furthermore, societies whose divisions reinforce each other are more prone to extreme or violent conflict and less able to manage conflict constructively. So how does this apply to Argentina again? Argentina has had violent culture of conflict in which conflict has often escalated to intense levels, such as the Caudillo state. Argentina's ability to resolve violent conflict, de-escalate away from violence, or prevent violence in the first place has been quite limited. These cultural patterns of poor conflict management are due to the presence of reinforcing divisions in Argentinian society that have given citizens few bonds of neutrality across lines of conflict. They are also due to the weak nature of Argentina's political institutions and its geographical distance from regions of the world where institutionalized conflict management is common. All right, so conditions like these, the Cadio emerged, and the term Cadio is loosely defined as a man with a personal following largely independent of any institutional leadership role. So these individuals were mostly military men, but they varied in background status. For instance, Juan Manuel de Rosas of Argentina was a powerful, wealthy landowner before his political rise, whereas Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana of Mexico gained his fortune and status after his power. Along with status, race was not necessarily a determining factor of whether or not an individual could be a Cadio leader. Central America was dominated by both a liberal white Creole Cadio and a conservative mestizo Cadio. In Venezuela, Jose Antonio Perez shared African descent. So what was the overarching determinant amongst these individuals? It was the ability to gain patronage and rise to the top of a competition of social networks. The talent for gaining others' confidence and loyalty. This type of social order is called clientelism, which emphasizes and exploits such relations within political context. So, Cadillas were able to form a tiered society in which they existed at the top, followed by their powerful supporters, and then the followers of these supporters. So anyone in opposition was not accepted. If a Cadio lost his power, a new one would take his place. So this formed a cycle of revolutions during this period in which physical and violent acts were often considered political participation. These revolutions didn't insinuate change or solution, but instead were a cycle of elites abusing power and then being taken over by those who aspired to be in the exact same position. So how a Cadillo was to display himself during this revolution was key. He must parade through the countryside to gain a following, as well as present a very strong physical presence in, bat in battle. And the resulting fate was often office or exile. Okay. So now that we understand that Argentina was highly divided, we have to understand specifically what those divisions were. So even prior to the Rosas period, Argentina was divided between Unitarians who sought to unify the nation under a central government and Federalists who preferred greater independence for provinces. This political divide was reinforced by a geographical division. The Unitarians were concentrated in the area of a new capital, Buenos Aires, 
while the forces of federalism were associated with the rural areas beyond the city. This political and geographic division was further reinforced by cultural differences. The Unitarians were the more highly educated and cultured group, including in their ranks writers, thinkers, poets, and artists. The Federalists, by contrast, exhibited a more crude cultural background in keeping with the rural intestines. In pre-Rosa's period, therefore, Argentina was divided politically, geographically, culturally, and along educational lines. Each of these divisions reinforced each other, and there were a few cross-cutting relationships to temper such divisional reinforcement. In the context of reinforcing divisions and escalated conflict, political leaders and citizens imagined that violence and repression constituted a solution to instability and conflict. This is why authoritarianism rises. The shared understanding between leaders and citizens that violence could solve crises led to another characteristic. Whereas many societies suffered their most violent moments during social revolution when the target of violence was the state and upper classes, in the Rosas period, violence was directed from the state towards the population. So, yeah, a prime example of the Cadio era is Juan Manuel de Rosas of Argentina, and he ruled from 1829 to 1852. And his main goal was to restore order and stability to Argentina from what he saw as an anarchy due to unitarian threat. So in order to rise to the top and maintain his rule, De Rosas embodied two very powerful political methods. On one hand, he was the violent authoritarian, but on the other, he was an advent populist. De Rosas understood that the key to maintaining social order was to control the lower class while still offering them some form of voice. This is because generally civil unrest leads to people with less to blame those with more. In order to avoid such disdain, he appropriated himself to the lifestyles and interests of groups such as Afro-Argentinos, the rural population, and the indigenous communities. Rosas reached out and communicated to these groups, offering them jobs and benefits within his law. Through his clientelistic system, he offered instant solutions and tangible benefits to those who complied in their times of need unlike the unknown prospects of a democratic system. He strongly identified with the rural population because of his wealthy rancher status and adopted gaucho dress and habits. He would even join people to dine and converse. But how he really gained a following was beyond these superficial things. He would do so by displaying acts that reflected the core morals and essence of these subgroups. One example is, on one account, he subjected himself to his own punishment of 50 lashes when he forgot to bring his lasso out to the field. Making this a public display, other gauchos were able to empathize with him because they place a strong cultural emphasis on equality and dignity. He even learned and spoke some indigenous languages and formed relationships with the chiefs of indigenous tribes. Along with creating a grand image of himself, he also formed these fictive kinships and these bonds of loyalty and understanding that were hard to be broken. Okay. Furthermore, looking into Rosas' reign, it was a reign of terror. And so his terror was conducted at night by small gangs who changed Buenos Aires from a vibrant, developing city into a place of fear and bloodshed. These small gangs were named the Mazorca. The nickname was a Spanish pun referring in grotesque fashion to the way many victims died having their throats cold. throats cut. They frequently murdered their victims on the spot, leaving the mutilated bodies as a message of terror for families and neighbors. It's interesting to see that Rosas denied all knowledge of or connection to the Mazorca. He insisted that his government neither sanctioned nor encouraged such groups. Instead, he assigned responsibility to unknown persons asserting that the Masorca were the spontaneous result of popular expressions of anti-Unitarianism. Rosas continued to deny connection to the Masorca even when widespread popular belief began to hold him responsible for their actions. Deaths inflicted by the Masorca clearly singled out particular groups in the population. These groups were also the ones defined by Rosas as undesirable. These included Unitarians and those who disagreed with the Rosas governments, writers, intellectuals, and the family and friends of those. 
While Rosas denied any connection to the Mazorca, it became increasingly clear that the activities of the latter furthered the political purpose of the dictatorship. His government rejected social spending in favor of military spending, and he rejected education, and particularly that aspect of it which encourages free thought. Rosas was himself uneducated and dismissed book learning as wasteful. During his reign, it was illegal to read books other than those designated by the regime or the church. Rosas' policies began by denying state funding for education and later forced teachers into exile. Rosas tried to control how people thought by telling them what to read and restricting access to education. People who broke the law reading or selling unendorsed books could be subjected to capital punishment or Masorca gang violence. The most likely victims of Rosas' regime were the students and intellectuals. Because the Unitarians included writers, intellectuals, thinkers, etc., he was suspicious of them and many fled to Uruguay to avoid the Masorca. It is from these exile writings that we have some of our best historical reporting on the Rosas period. The prime example of this was Esteban Echeverria, who, while in exile in Uruguay, composed The Slaughterhouse or El Matadero in 1838, even though it was not published until 1871. Echeverria, similar to lots of Unitarians, imagined himself as a nationalist and a political activist. He used fiction to articulate a vision of a nation as it was and how it should be. And in many ways, he lived the tragedies he described through the experience of forced exile. He was a strong opponent of dictatorship and caudillism. He formed part of an urbane intellectual liberalism who had little sympathy for the sensibilities and capacities of the rural folk who formed the backbone of Rosas' dictatorship. He agreed with other Unitarian intellectuals that the struggle that confronts Latin America is a battle between civilization and backwardness. Almost invariably cast in racial terms, this precluded any possibility that the new republics would embrace horizontal, fraternal forms of citizenship. So today, there still exists a largely fragmented society in Latin America. Cadios didn't really solve any of the unrest that dwelled within Latin America, but instead perpetuated it, creating a more complicated divisions. This debate became clear as recently as 2003 in the city of Buenos Aires, when the city council discussed whether or not to rename part of Sarmiento Street after De Rosas. Domingo Festino Sarmiento was the liberal president of Argentina post the reign of Juan Manuel de Rosas from 1868 to 1874. He represented the exact opposite, being an intellectual writer himself, and he even wrote a critique on de Rosas and the Cadillo era that gained him wide recognition. He valued education, democracy, and modernization. So in the city hall in 2003, 112 people showed up to speak, including descendants of both of the leaders. On one side, people shouted things such as, the tyrant deserves no honors. Whereas on the other side, people shouted lies. Supporters of Sarmiento argued that de Rosas represented what became a Peronism in the 1940s, a tyrannical system in which concentration of power is in the hands of a single leader and that he doesn't deserve the respect to be represented in such an honorable way as a road name. On the other side, a descendant of de Rosas said, quote, we have been unable to incorporate our past, and that is why we are still a nation in convulsions. So, should Cadios be revered as tyrants or heroes? Should Rosas, along with other Cadios of that era, be recognized for any of the good that they did, despite their violent tactics? A more modern school of thought, La Nueva Escuela Historica, paints Cadios as neither black nor white, but as the complex figures that they are. However, it's hard not to remain fragmented when put out of academic context. Being in the place of someone with a past of such dramatically strong opinions that sway in either direction, it is near impossible for one to put these feelings aside when looking towards an uncertain future. Thank you. Thank you.